Welcome to worship today at the New Horizons Christian Church, whether you're here in person or uh, watching us online. We're just so glad you're here. This is the last Sunday of April. And if you feel like me, it feels like ever since we got into March, the year has been going by quickly. Uh, but it's great to be here together, worship a couple things. One is, as part of worship, we always have communion. And in fact, if you are uh, in worship today, you should have picked up one of these little packets and or making sure you get the little thing on the inside. And I usually joke that you should start now to try to unwrap this. You don't have to start till the sermon. It gives you something to do, right? <laughs> but if you're at home, get your communion. Here it is. Um, also, in terms of offering, uh, ever since the uh, COVID time, we don't pass the trays anymore, but there is a tray in the back for your offering. Or you can get online and give to Givelify, or you can just stop by the church or mail something in. And we're very appreciative of all the ways in which people have been giving to this church, not only financially, but in other ways as well to our ministries. So thank you for your offering. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, it's wonderful. It isn't it great that I turned the whole band, I turned, they're all gone. We once had a band here. Isn't it great when they're playing? In fact, uh, Rob and Laura, comes all the way, they come all the way from Indianapolis to play in the band. So that's fantastic. I'm not even kidding. That's even true. Uh, if you're in uh, the sanctuary today, just a reminder that at the end, a deacon will help escort you out as we try to keep our social distancing. So anyway, it's so great everybody's here, and I'm thrilled about that. I want to recognize a particular person today, and that's Rose. Is Rose here? All right, Rose. Woo! Someday this last week, it was Wednesday, was Administrative Professional Day, and we have a flower arrangement for Rose that we thought we could give it to her at the beginning of worship, and she could sit with it in her lap, or she can come up and get it after worship. So, Rose, we're so grateful for what you do, especially in these particular challenging times. So that's a small thing, but it's our appreciation for all you do. Let's give Rose a, a round of applause. And if you could hear the noise of all those in their homes clapping, you'd know how much louder that is. That's what I've got. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we are grateful for this day. We are grateful for this whole month, but especially this day of worship. And as we gather today, whether in person or online, we know that we're part of a community, part of a family of faith. And we do give you thanks for the many blessings we have, certainly in terms of COVID, and uh, people being able to get vaccinated and, and being able to gather together and worship. What a great thing it is. We're also grateful for uh, decisions that were made in the terms of courts this week. We're grateful that justice is prevailing. We're grateful that others this week took time off to work on our planet. So many things, Lord, happening in the life, not only of our own lives in the African area, but across our country and our world. And we're here to say thank you, God. Thank you for everything that you give to us, everything that you do for us. And especially just in this hour of worship, thank you for blessing us with your presence and your word. May our hearts and minds be opened to what you have to say to us. And this we pray in your son's name. Amen. Again, we're continuing in our series uh, kind of based upon the things that you gave us in terms of those little words on cards. And Allie's kind of put a display out there uh, when you come into the um, gathering area. Some of you who watch worship online have sent us uh, not the card itself, but a word. So if you didn't participate in this, you have a word that you'd like us to look at. We can't look at all of them exactly, uh, but we're doing our best. So we're continuing in that today. Many of us have a favorite vacation or getaway spot, don't we? A place where we go to again and again as often as we can, depending upon how much money we've got or time we have. And for some of us, it's a particular maybe state park or national park, maybe even a metro park in the mm -hmm. Summit County area. And some people like to stay in motels. Sometimes you go to a cottage. Some of you have RVs. Some of you go camping. There is just something about getting away for a weekend or a week that's renewing, isn't it? It restores relationships, reconnects us to others, as well as to ourselves, our own souls. If you have a, va a favorite vacation or retreat spot, where is it? You know, I was a kid growing up, our family uh, sometimes went to this resort, and I use the word resort loosely, place in Canada called Marble Point Lodge. It doesn't even exist anymore, 
But when we were kids, we'd go to this place. It was called Crow Lake. That doesn't sound very romantic, does it? It was on Crow Lake in Marmora, Ontario. And it was a rustic sort of place. I think we must have had a bathroom. But if you wanted to get a shower, you had to walk up this hill. And there was a little shower out there, pretty primitive. Or sometimes our parents just gave us a bar of soap and said, go to the lake. <laughs> Later, our family bought a little cottage in a place called Conyot Lake in Pennsylvania. And it was really small, but we spent a lot of time there, had a lot of kids go there with us. And we would just go to the beach or we'd go fishing or boating. Holly's family had similar kinds of experiences when she was growing up. Then we had our own kids. And a few different times we went to a place called the Outer Banks. I know that some of you have been to the Outer Banks. But we've become more so recently regulars in Upper Michigan at a place called Crystal Lake. And we do the same kind of things that we did when we were kids. And now our grandkids come along, we do the same kinds of things. We go to the beach, we have daily bonfires, we grill out. Sometimes we fish, sometimes we rent a boat, sometimes Holly goes out on a kayak. That's the stuff we do. And if you've had a vacation like that, you know, usually the biggest decision you make every day is, when are we eating? And we love to vacation, our family does, by the water. And if there's a water and some version of a beach, we're happy. And even when we visited Josh in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, we usually end up on the beach. So for our family, and it might be true for yours, for our family, being by the water is essential for our physical, spiritual, emotional, and relational health. It revives our relationships with each other, with those we care about the most. And I would even say it helps rekindle our relationship with God. Now, whether Abigail, who's six, would say that, I don't know. Joseph probably wouldn't. He's four. But I know it helps you get in touch with the things that are most important. When you get away, you go away on vacation. Now, do you have a place like that in your life? A place that's crucial to your sense of personal peace, happiness, and health? And those are some of the things that you wrote on your cards on Easter Things like be healthy, have renewed physical and mental strength, closeness to people, live in peace, a bunch of different things like that. Those are things that you wrote down on cards that you wanted to work on this year, that you wanted to be part of your story. And many of us are anxious, aren't we, to restore some of those kinds of vacation things we used to have in the past. And that's the kind of stuff that got frayed last year. And so a vacation spot, time at the beach, or wherever it is that you go, certainly would help you restore relationships, get healthier, wouldn't it? And guess what? Today's scripture could be called A Day at the Beach with Jesus. In fact, Adam just changed it online. So if you go to look at this sermon later, it's going to say A Day at the Beach with Jesus. And it involves all the kind of stuff we've just been talking about. Fishing and boating, time in the water, even a walk by the seashore. In today's story, there's going to be a bonfire. There's going to be a cookout as these disciples come together and renew relationships with each other and with Jesus. And we are in the last chapter of the Gospel of John, chapter 21. And there's a lot of details in the story we're going to read. We're not going to look at all of them. We're going to lift up some of them. And if you know anything about uh, the Gospel of John, you know that some of the Bible experts, of which I am not, would call chapter 21, what we're going to look at today, kind of an add-on. That is, it seemed like the gospel should have ended at chapter 20. So we got a passage today that's rich in details, has a little bit of controversy, but I think it's going to be worth our time. It starts like this. Again, John 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. In other words, about seven of them, right? I'm going out to fish, said Simon. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. A couple of initial observations. When last we heard from the disciples, at least in this gospel, last week uh, we did the... Uh, road to Emmaus. But when last we heard about the disciples in this gospel, they were still locked up. 
They're still behind closed doors. Even though Jesus had come and breathed his spirit on them, even though he had sent them out, they're still kind of hanging out at home. But in today's text, some time has passed. Didn't tell us how much. Some time has passed, and the disciples are starting to get out a little bit. Maybe they've had the Roman Pfizer vaccine. Maybe they're starting to feel some herd immunity, but they're starting to return to normal. Does sound familiar? And normal for the disciples is where? Out in the lake, fishing. And if you have a different translation, depending upon your translation, sometimes it's called the Sea of Galilee. Sometimes it's called the Sea of Tiberias. Same thing. And they're not there to sunbathe. They're not playing on the beach. They're not making sand castles. They go to fish. And it's a good bet they've gone to a place they've been to before, somewhere familiar. Now, there's a lot, when you read commentary on this, there's a lot of people who would say, well, what's wrong with the disciples? Jesus says to go out into the world, forgive sins. But what are they doing? They go out into the world and they go fishing. And they're not going fishing for people. They're going fishing for fish. You might say, that's not exactly doing what Jesus would want, is it? But isn't it true that when times are stressful in our lives, we like to go to something we know? So there they are. They're out fishing, something they know. And it's a shared activity. Maybe they've got to start small. Maybe before they go out there and heal the world, they've got to start small, doing something together, doing something like fishing. Because the truth of the matter is, they haven't been that great as disciples, have they? If we had the Disciple of the Year award, none of them would get it. But at least Peter shows some leadership. Let's go fishing. And six of them say, sure. So maybe this is a test run. Maybe they're going to start fishing, and if they can succeed at fishing, they can do something else. And I'd say this, they're not fishing for fun. They're fishing for funds, right? They have to make a living. They can't do it with a laptop. they got to actually be out there. So there they are fishing. They're out in the boat. They fish all night long. Nothing. Not even a little perch. Not even a sunfish. Not either some lousy fish they'd throw back in. So that's what happened so far. Out in the boat, nothing. Fishing all night long. The story continues. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Heard this problem before, right? He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. So I need a show of hands here. At home. How many of you have ever been fishing? Okay, right. And ever anybody come up to you, are the fish fighting? Are you catching anything? And they only ask you this when you got nothing, Right? You got a bucket there for all your fish, it's empty. Or you got one of those little stringers, nothing. But hey, are the fish fighting? In other words, are you a loser? You don't even know how to fish, do you? What are you using? Worms? You should use this complicated. The only time anybody's ever asked me if the fish are biting is when they're not. So here are the disciples. They've been in the boat, they've been all night long. It's early in the morning. Jesus going, hey, how are those fish biting? I'm guessing they're a little bit tired, I'm guessing they're hungry. I'm guessing they're a little bit grumpy. And now a guy who we're going to find out later is 100 yards away. It's 100 yards away from him going, hey, you, this is where you should fish. I'm guessing they're not that crazy about his advice. But on the other hand, they've been out fishing all night. What's one more throw, right? So they, they throw the net in, and they get so many fish. We're going to find out how many in a minute. They can't pull it all in. Now, I know some of you uh, are Bible experts or at least probably know more about the Bible than I do, and you're saying to yourself, doesn't this sound like another story in the Gospels? And sure enough, Gospel of Luke, the disciples are fishing all night long. They can't catch anything. Jesus tells them where to drop the nets. So many, they can't pull it in. In other words, there's another story that sounds just like this almost in the Bible. So the question is this. Is it the same story just put in different places, or is it two different stories? Now, I went to Harvard. You can tell, right? I, I've heard laughter. I went to Harvard. You can tell, right? Thank you for that. I have a diploma. It's on my wall. I got it for 20 bucks, right? 
I went to Harvard, he said again. I actually took a class on the Gospel of John. Right? I took a class in which we looked at things like this passage with this expert on the Gospel of John. But your guess is as good as mine. Is this one story? Is it two stories? We don't know. And the truth of the matter is it doesn't matter. Right? But let's for today assume that John's put it in the right place at the end of the Gospel. So we have this story, this fishing story, unsuccessful fishing story that Jesus saves. And this is where the story, the next part, diverges from what Luke has. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Now this little section of scripture is so nutty, it's hard to know where to start. And again, this whole section is not in Luke. First of all, you got Simon Peter, and he's never known to process things uh, deeply. He just reacts. So he hears that the fishing guide on the shore is actually Jesus, so he puts his clothes on and jumps in the water. Does that sound weird to you? Usually when you go swimming, you take your clothes off, right? Hopefully leaving something on, you're going to disturb the neighbors at the beach. But not Peter. He goes, I better get all dressed up. Now maybe commentators have said he's kind of feeling he needs to cover up in front of you. I don't know. But he leaves everybody. Anybody here ever seen Forrest Gump? You know the movie Forrest Gump? Remember when he sees uh, Captain Dan? He jumps in the water. Remember that he's swimming to shore and the boat crashes? That's kind of what Peter does, but he lucks out. At least the other guys are in the boat, so it doesn't crash. So he just jumps in the water. He runs to the beach. Meanwhile, kind of inexplicably, Jesus has a bonfire going, right? And there's already fish on it. Where'd they come from? We don't know right? He's got some fish cooking. He also has some of those cheese biscuits from Red Lobster. Boy, those are good. <laughs> he knows these guys are hungry. So he's cooking up fish and he's got, and they always give you those biscuits. So you fill up on those, right? But you want to, you want to sneak them out in your purse, right? So you might say, does Jesus actually need any more fish to feed these guys? Apparently he's already got fish. He's got cheese biscuits, right? But he says to Peter, hey, Peter, Get some fish. So Peter goes back to the boat, and he's on some adrenaline-fueled rush because he hauls the net in, and the scripture said it contains exactly 153 large fish. That's a lot of fish. And who counted them all? One, two, nobody knows, right? Another thing, is the number 153 significant, and people have added them up and multiplied them and got the square root. Is it meaningful? Who knows, right? I think the point is, it's a lot. It's a lot of fish. So Jesus says to the disciples who've now come up, come on, let's have some breakfast. And it's kind of a reverse miracle. If you remember the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus took five loaves and, and what, two fishes, three fish, over. He took five loaves and two fish and he fed 5,000 people plus all these other people. Now he takes all these fish, all those cheesy biscuits and feeds seven people. I hope they were hungry. So what a great story. And this would be a great place to end the gospel, wouldn't it? You got the disciples coming out. They're starting to feel more comfortable being out in the world. They have this successful uh, beach trip, and they've been fishing, and there's Jesus, and there's a bonfire. And it doesn't tell us, but we know they sang Kumbaya, right? And they're all just happy, and they got a lot of fish. It's all good. Everybody reconnects. Wouldn't that be a great place to stop the gospel? Wouldn't that be a great vacation day? For those of you who have been to the beach, for those of you who have been fishing, you'd say, that's a good day. It's all good, and we got the bonfire and everything else. It's a morale booster. They need a win. They got it. A great place to stop the gospel. Go, team. Feels good. But wait. There's more. Because the, the story's going to change dramatically. How many of you have ever taken a walk on the beach with somebody you cared about? 
How many of you have been walking on the beach on vacation? Maybe you're looking for seashells or maybe you're working, looking for sea glass, but you're just kind of taking, isn't it great to take a walk on the beach? Usually your conversation isn't very heavy. You're just enjoying being by the water. But that's not the walk that Jesus and Peter have. It isn't a hunt for a seashell. It's the hunt for Peter's heart. I think a lot of you will remember this. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. What a tough conversation this is. And I'm sure the text is correct when it says that, that Peter was hurt. Right here is Jesus pushing him. And not unfairly either because he's going to have a hard time. And people a lot smarter than me have said, you know what? Peter denied Jesus three times. Is it any coincidence that three different times he has to affirm Jesus, affirm the love? Now Peter could have said enough is enough. I'm tired of this cross-examination. I don't think I'm up for this. But Jesus is actually doing him a favor because Peter's life's going to be challenging. He's going to have people push him. And, and Jesus is kind of saying, I just want to make sure that you're the right guy. So we had a happy ending fishing story. And now the story has shifted to the restoration of the relationship between Jesus and Peter. And that's the kind of thing that can happen at the beach, can it? Especially when we set other things aside and we focus on what really counts. And Jesus lets Peter, Peter know that despite how much he's failed, and Peter has failed many times, right? Despite his failings, that he has a role to play. And what's his role? Feed my sheep, take care of the flock. I know a lot of you know the Gospel of John pretty well. But earlier in the Gospel, in the gospel of John is the one who keeps saying the I am statements. You know, I'm the bread of life, I'm this. Earlier in the Gospel, Jesus has said this. I am the good shepherd. I will lay down my life for the sheep. And that's what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us. But then he says to Peter, your turn. Though Jesus is giving this assignment to Peter, I think that caring for others isn't just a thing that he's supposed to do alone. I think we're all supposed to do it. A lot of people, and it could be one of you, a lot of people have received comfort from this little fable called Footprints in the Sand. Everybody know Footprints in the Sand? And I've read this at weddings. I've read it at funerals. It's another walking on the beach story. Get it together, Allie. You're not helping me, right? So it's a story about two people walking on the beach. And in the story, a person looks back at the end of their life and sees two sets of footprints. But at a certain point in their life, at the tough points in their lives, the person says, there's only one set of footprints. And you remember why? Because, yeah, Jesus says, it's not that I left you, I carried you. In those times, child, I carried you. And those of us who know me know that I don't like that parable. I don't like that fable. You know why? Because life isn't like that. Instead, this is what it's going to look like if you happen to be walking on the beach at the end of your life. You're going to look back and you know what you're going to see? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sets of footprints. Because our lives are lived in community with so many people in our lives, right? And the truth of the matter, and it's my, the truth of my life, and I'm, I know it's the truth of your life. Sometimes we're carrying people. Sometimes they're carrying us. Sometimes it's hard to know who carries who, isn't it? Just ask longtime married couples. Wives, this might be your day, right? Husbands, this might be your day. Or children of aging parents. Sometimes we care for those who used to care for us, don't we? And if you haven't so far, you're going to. 
And using the language of our passage, sometimes we're the shepherds. Sometimes we're the sheep. And those babies we cared for grow up to make decisions about us. So be good to them, right? Sometimes we're the ones changing the diapers. Sometimes the reverse is true. And John anticipates all of this, right? Because later in this, I mean, this is one of the richest chapters in all of Scripture, I think. Later in the chapter, again, chapter 21, this is what Jesus says. Verily, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. Tell me this isn't true. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. That's, if you're getting older, don't focus on that. It'd be bad, right? Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then Jesus said, again to Peter, follow me. So Jesus is talking to Peter. He's talking to all of us. Peter has a unique role to be sure, but Jesus wants all of us to follow him, doesn't he? And Jesus wants to know the condition of our hearts. Do we really love him? And if we say that we love Jesus, how do we show it? Again, in, in the first John, Jesus uh, says this, or John writes this about Jesus. If we say we love God, but we hate our brothers and sisters, we're not telling the truth. We're liars. You know, I think about all the kinds of words that people wrote on those cards. And a lot of people wrote something like this. I want to become a better spouse. I want to become a better person. I want to do things like that about relationships with others. I want my own health to get better. I want to live in peace. So much of it, though, is communal. And here's what I know. There's no magic formula to any of these things. Yet we all know that these goals or stories, things don't change overnight. You don't become a loving person one day if you're hateful the next. You don't become healthy one day if you're unhealthy the day before. It's always a little bit of change, isn't it? One little change at a time. Well, you might say, well, I know I wrote that on my card, but I'm really too old to change. To you, I say this, and I say it to myself. We can all make at least one small change every day, can't we? Can't we do one small thing? And if you're trying to be more loving, can't you do a little loving thing today? If we say we love Jesus, can't we love one person every day? It's never too late to do the, wrong, to the right thing. Find the time, make a call, find the time, send a card to say to the people that you love that you love them. Now, Peter made the mistake of a lifetime. In fact, Peter made a lot of mistakes, didn't he? But Jesus didn't give up on him. Jesus loved him and restored him, and he just sent him out. The disciples locked themselves away, but they finally found the courage to go out and they only went fishing, but it was a start. They went fishing first, then they changed the world. And we've talked about how some regard chapter 21 is kind of an add-on story, add-on chapter of the Bible, but it ends with words that are so true to our church today. This is how John uh, ends his gospel. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. John anticipated that there would be many stories involving Jesus yet to be written. I don't think that uh, John knew your name or my name. He didn't know the name of this church. But he knew that stories about Jesus, and people encountering Jesus would continue to grow and multiply is the world big enough for all the stories that we're now writing? The world is a big place, but your stories of loving and caring and improving and getting better, your stories can fill the world. So keep writing them. Amen. we prepare to uh, have our time of communion, now is the time where we get to make the noise preparing. So we get to peel back our plastic 
and our lid on our cups. And if you're at home and you don't have your communion, now is the time to run and get that and get that uh, so you can join us at the table. It's actually like a real meal where you hear someone in the kitchen banging the dishes and getting everything ready because you get to hear all the tearing and the pulling. It's kind of fun. Kind of fun. <laughs> well, it is for me. <laughs> I'm sorry for your luck over there. <laughs> As we begin our time at the table, let us say our Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We remember that night when Jesus sat with his disciples, and he took bread, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. When supper had ended, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, until he comes again. Let us pray. Dear Lord, this table reminds us that you don't care about us just physically, but you care about us physically and emotionally. This bread is a symbol of your son's body broken for us and for our physical well-being. This wine is a symbol of forgiveness to help us emotionally forgive others and to forgive ourselves so that you can forgive us and show us all of your love and blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, take the bread and the cup. This is the body and the blood of Christ broken and shed for you. today I leave you with this blessing. May the God of strength bless you. May the intensity of God's love move you to love in turn without condition and with mercy. May the power of God's presence in you bring you to a place of courage and resolution as you encounter challenges to justice and peace in an imperfect world. May you be blessed by God who is your strength. Amen.